Hey everybody, this is Ryan Smith, principal and founder of Think SBA, and welcome to another episode of the My SBA Loan Pro podcast, Face to Face. I have with us today, Fernando Ponce with Primary Funding. Primary Funding is a non-traditional lending source located here in San Diego, California. Fernando, thank you for joining the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on on your show here. Um, had a chance to listen to some of your episodes, so really, really good stuff. I like what you're doing, and uh, I'm, I'm honored to uh, be a guest on your show here today. I know you're going to share a lot of wonderful information with the audience. If you would, start us off by telling everyone how you got to this point and what you do as a lender for primary funding. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm about as native a San Diegan as you can be without being born in San Diego. I was actually, my, my, my parents lived in San Diego, but went up to LA when I was born. So I was born in LA. They moved right back down to San Diego. So I've been in San Diego pretty much all my life with the exception of a short three-year stint that I, I lived in Arizona. Um, so, you know, love San Diego, been here for years, pretty much all my life. Um, gosh, so I, I, you know, got into banking at the worst possible time, I actually got into banking right in 2000 and, and set at the end of 2007, um, and then got to be on that whole ride uh, of you know the the financial collapse and everything that went down, all the terrible things that happened in, in the banking world. Um, and so it, it was it was an interesting time, but I got to learn a lot, obviously, right? And and uh, I started at Washington Mutual, which was a huge savings and loan. Um, and and so when they ended up being acquired by Chase d during that time, that was a, a great opportunity for me because, you know, Chase came in, they had a big bank, had lots of opportunity. They wanted to grow in, in California. And so it created the opportunity for me to really start learning about business lending and, and you know, how you how you work with business owners and, you know, all of their cash management needs and everything. And then, you know, how you, you parlay that into taking care of their lending needs. So um, really thanks to kind of everything that happened during that time, it, it allowed me to really uh, come into banking at a time when it was really difficult, but really learn, you know, how to really take care of customers and work through tough deals and, and understand, you know, how to really drill down into, into, into the finances and things and, and try to come out the other side with, with a deal. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing your background there. How did you land with primary funding? Yeah, so I, I had a really great career at Chase. I mean, I was there almost 11 years, um, but, you know, it's a big bank and, you know, with like with most big corporations, eventually you just kind of, I, I just wasn't really happy there anymore. Started looking for other opportunities and uh, one, I, I got connected with primary funding years before that uh, with one of the, the owners at the time named uh, Greg Solomon and, and uh, had, re, you know, reconnected with him and we just started talking and it just felt like a good fit because the company, it's a small company, we're a small company. You know, we've been here in San Diego for about 27, 28 years now. Um, it's privately owned. You know, the, the owners of the company are great people that really love working with them. So I was just really attracted to the ability to stay in the industry that I was in, but be able to help all the customers that I wasn't able to help when I was at Chase, right? And And do that and be on the other side of it and help those clients. And then eventually hopefully get them bank to back to bankability. Um, and so it's just been a great ride, you know, the past six years here. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Here's what I'd like you to do. If you can break down what you do at primary funding for small business owners, and then connect the dots for us, give us a few simple use cases. And then what we'll do is we'll jump into some case studies. Yeah, absolutely. So, the role that we fill at, at primary funding is really we're trying to be a bridge to the bank. And that could either be for one of two reasons. We could either help somebody who's gone to a bank and they've applied for funding there and they have, you know, for whatever reason, it could be credit, it could be cash flow, uh, it could be collateral issues. They're unable to get funding there. And then, you know, we'll get, we'll get a phone call from a banker, uh, ideally, and, and they'll tell us, hey, this is the situation. We were unable to help the customer because of X, Y, and Z. And then our job is really to try to figure out how we can help them with those cash flow needs, uh, how we can help provide financing on the front end. And then ultimately, our goal is to get them to bankability and help them to go back to that bank that referred them to us and get long term financing there. Um, so that's one way that we, we typically um, you know, connect with a client. The other would be a client that's already had bank financing and 
uh, maybe has run into some trouble. You know, we've had a, some pretty, pretty uh, tumultuous, you know, kind of financial environments here lately. And a lot of businesses have run into trouble with, you know, the, the complete shutdowns from COVID and, uh, and, and then where we are now uh, with supply chain issues. So sometimes businesses that are established run into some, some trouble as well. And that's a situation where we sometimes can come in and provide a takeout financing uh, if, if they've run into trouble with the bank. Um, the type of financing that we typically like to provide uh, we're usually going to work with B2B industries, right? So we really like to focus on accounts receivables. That's where our strength lies. So companies that are providing a product or a service, uh, they're getting paid on 30, 60 or 90 day terms. And we're able to come in and we're able to leverage those accounts receivables and either through a, a factoring program of some kind and an asset based line of credit, um, or even uh, if they have purchase orders on the front end, and we can come in and provide financing to help them mobilize on those purchase orders and buy you know, raw goods to get their product manufactured. Um, and then we'll, we'll move them into a factoring facility once they've actually invoiced. Um, so that's really our strength. We're, we're an asset-based lender. We really lead with accounts receivable, but we will also, you know, do a mix of purchase orders, inventory. We'll, we'll try to, you know, leverage other assets that the company has as well, but always we're going to lead with accounts receivable. That's going to be our primary uh, um, asset that we're going to leverage. And can you talk about, so you mentioned different credit facilities. Can you talk about each one independently, uh, give a, a, a practical application for each? Uh, and then if you would talk about some of the benefits and maybe some of the negatives uh, that each one brings with them. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll, we'll start with uh, with PO financing because that's kind of where the, the where a lot of these deals will start at, at times, right? So with a PO or purchase order, right? A company will receive a purchase order from, it could be the government or it could be a, you know, a large institution, Home Depot, Lowe's, you, you know, you name it. Um, and they receive a purchase order to provide a product. Um, a lot of times they're having to, uh, they're having to carry that cost up front, right? So maybe their, their cost of goods on the front end might be anywhere between 30 to 60% of what that face value of that purchase order is. And as these purchase orders get larger, sometimes it gets very difficult for them to carry, you know, carry that cost over that production period, which can be anywhere from 30 to 90 days at times. So we will actually come in on purchase order finance and we'll provide financing on that purchase order. We'll cover the cost of goods, right? Pay their suppliers directly, make sure they have the capital to start to, to go ahead and engage the supplier and get the process going. Uh, and then we'll sit on that. And once, once that, manufacturing process is done, then they'll deliver the product to the, uh, to the buyer or the end user. And at that point, they're able to invoice. And uh, now they're going to get paid on 30, 60 or 90 day terms, right? So then from there, we basically transition out of PO, we pay off the PO facility, and we factor that invoice, right? So we advance a larger percentage of that invoice now, uh, not, now that the work is complete. And there's a little bit less risk, right? Because they've already completed that manufacturing process. So we're able to do a higher amount. Maybe that's going to be somewhere between 80 to 85% of the face value of that invoice. Um, and then we'll sit and wait on that, right? So we give them that cash on the front end on the PO side to, to mobilize. Uh, then once the work is complete, we give them additional capital to, you know, maybe they got to cover employees, rent, whatever else they need, or they can roll that into another project. And then we just sit and wait. And once that invoice pays, then we will we will take our fees, Right, whatever whatever the cost was for that period of time, and we will give them back the, the difference, whatever's left over on on that on that PO or I'm sorry on that invoice uh, face value amount. Um, so that's how purchase order uh, financing and factoring will typically work. A lot of times they'll work hand in hand. Uh, if we're going to do a purchase order financing program, we're going to have factoring that's going to take that out. Um, and then sometimes clients come to us and they're not they're not making a product, right? They're just providing a service. Once it's done, then they're waiting 30, 60, 90 days. So then we'll just use factoring on, on the on the back end there to get them to speed up their cash flow process, get them the capital they need up front to cover payroll, whatever overhead they have, right? So benefits to to you know factoring and PO, it's it's really beneficial for companies that are scaling um, because you know traditionally uh, a, a bank, a traditional bank lender, they're going to do lines of credit based on. Um, what the previous year's financials were and, and really kind of historically where the, the company has been. Whereas with purchase order finance and factoring, we're really forward looking, right? We're looking at what contracts do you have now? What do you have in accounts receivable now that we can leverage? And so when it comes to scalability, our product 
works really well for that. Because if you're a company that's maybe been paying your dues, you've been, you know, picking up contracts here and there over the years, and then suddenly, you know, you, you've, your, your, your hard work pays off and you land a big, you know, multi-million dollar contract where maybe previously you'd only been doing a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Suddenly it's like, whoa, hey, I, I, I got this contract. Now what am I going to do? Right? Well, that's a great situation for us because we're going to leverage that contract and make sure you have the capital you need to fulfill and perform on that. Um, so some of the negatives to, to purchase order and, and, and factoring, you know, it's very structured, right? So it's a self-liquidating uh, uh, financing vehicle. So the payments are, are actually coming to us, right? So, so as, as uh, invoices pay, the facility's paying down. So it's very structured in that w- when we give you the capital, you don't really have a choice of carrying that, uh, that balance beyond what the payment terms are, right? Once it pays, it's going to liquidate the account and then we can start the process all over again or we can, we can do this with multiple invoices at one time. Um, but it, it is very, it is more, far more restricted than a line of credit where you can line of credit, you can just pull the money out, use it for whatever you want and then pay it back as needed or, or you know, just make a minimum payment. It doesn't work that way with factoring. Um, I would say the other, you know, we're, we're definitely, you know, more expensive than a traditional bank, right? I mean, we're, we're taking on more risk. Um, and because of that, again, we don't see ourselves as a permanent solution. We really want to be uh, a company that you use in transition and we're providing financing, helping you scale. And then once you kind of level out, you're transitioning to a bank. Um, and I think, you know, there's also, I think a lot of negative, negative connotation around the word factoring, right? Because I think for many years, there have been negative aspects to it. They, they've been known to Factoring companies have been known to uh, lock borrowers into long-term contracts. Very hard to get out of these things. Um, so th- there's usually not very transparent, uh, not a lot of transparency in the in the contracts and the financing agreements. Um, so that's one of the things we pride ourselves on. We're very transparent. You know, all of our pricing is very straightforward, uh, and we don't have contracts. So everything we do is month to month. You're able to use this as much or as little as you want. We don't have any minimums. Um, so, so, you know, company that's in a B2B industry, they have either uh, purchase orders, they have invoices that, that, they, that they need financed, uh, are unable to qualify for a traditional line of credit. Those are companies that could be a great fit for factoring or purchase order financing. Um, and then the last uh, product that we'll, we'll provide, we do have an asset-based line of credit that we will do as well. So this is far more, uh, you know, resembles more of a traditional bank facility. Um, but we do, you know, we have a borrowing base where you basically are, it's a, it's a formula that, you know, essentially all of the accounts receivable goes into all of the, uh, inventory goes into, and then based on a certain percentages that we use, we'll, it'll dictate month over month as we get an updated, uh, balance sheet and, and accounts receivables, it'll dictate how much you can borrow on based on your assets. Right. So, so every month it'll fluctuate, right? Some months it'll be higher, some months it'll be lower. And it's, as it, as it fluctuates, you have to either pay down or you can borrow more. Um, so that, again, the, the, the pros to that is far more flexibility, right? So you can really, you know, but, but it still is very structured in that it's going to be tied to what your accounts receivable and your inventory and all of that is. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that. And uh, so as a former banker, you were a banker, I was a banker. So when we are inside of a bank, we only like businesses that are on the constant increase, right? So we don't like businesses that kind of go up and down. Um, and like you said, when we underwrite a business, we're underwriting, what did you do? What did you do last year? What did you do the year before? Um, and so what I hear you saying is primary funding fits for businesses who aren't able at the time to qualify for traditional bank financing, which let's face it, that's most of the time where business owners go, right? They go to the bank, they apply, they really don't know what they're going to get. They don't know if they're going to be approved, declined. And then unfortunately, if they're working with someone who's inexperienced, that individual won't even necessarily tell them why they weren't approved. However, if they know you, then they can transition the client and the credit to you. And then you can really dive in. You use your background as a banker and all of your newfound information that you have and your expertise to really tailor and craft a credit facility for that small business that they wouldn't otherwise qualify for at the bank. And as a, again, non-traditional lender, as you said, it may be more expensive than the bank, but it's not more expensive than not taking the business. 
And that's what I always emphasize to people. It's either nothing or you will make a profit. And what I appreciate about primary funding, I've known about them now for several years, just like you said, you're transparent, you don't have contracts, and you allow the business owner to develop a plan to wean themselves off of a credit facility you provide so they can get back to traditional financing. Talk to me a little bit about the industry as a whole and what a business owner should look out for, maybe from some of your unsavory competitors. Yeah, that's a um, that's a great question. So, particularly here recently, and in, in, you know, we're in, we're in Southern California, and California has passed a, a several laws, you know, that pertain and, and kind of govern more what alternative lenders such as primary funding can do. So. Um, very, very important to, to look at, you know, all, all lenders in California now should off, provide basically a disclosure on what the true cost of their financing is, right? This wasn't, wasn't necessary before, but um, it, it is now. There's a lot more transparency, which is actually great for a company like us because now it, it kind of levels the playing field to show, you know, wh where we are apples to apples. Um, so you should definitely always get you know, if, if they don't give you a disclosure that shows, hey, what your true cost of capital is, that's a huge red flag, right? That right away, that means they're breaking the law uh, potentially there. Um, there are some caveats to that based on dollar amounts and what have you. But um, I mean, all, lenders should always be very transparent with the borrower, you know, first and foremost. Um, if there are contracts, then that's something you should really, you know, give, give a, a second thought to because some of these contracts can be very difficult to get out of. Um, sometimes there's a very short window on the anniversary date of when the facility was, uh, you know, was established. And if you're, if you don't time it perfectly, you're locked in for another year. And, you know, the cancellation fees on these contracts can be quite extensive sometimes. So very difficult to get out of. Um, so definitely transparency and pricing. Um, the, uh, the, um, the contracts. So that's, that's a big, big red flag. I mean, I would say those are the two main things, you know, we, we get looped in, lumped in a lot also with MCA lenders or merchant cash advance. Um, you know, we're, we're not an MCA lender. We, you know, factoring is a very specific type of service where we're really just advancing based on the invoices and we're discounting the invoice, right? That's how it works. Um, so, you know, every, everything we do is on a monthly basis. We don't have any daily or weekly types of payments or anything like that. So keep an eye out for that as well. If, if somebody is telling you, Hey, you got to, a daily debit that we're going to take out of your account or, you know, even weekly, I mean, it should really be a monthly payment. Right. And, and that's, that's really where you should be, what you should be looking for and striving for. Um, and one of the things that I've been telling a lot of our, our clients and, and, you know, understand your margins, right. It is very important right now. Um, capital is, you know, other than in, in 2008, 2009, you know, capital is about as hard as it's been to, to, to get right now. Um, and so, and it's more expensive, right? Because rates have gone up. So it's really important that as a borrower and as a business owner, you understand your margins, you know exactly what your return on investment is going to be if you take a certain financing facility, right? And so you should be able to go out there and make a quick decision based on, you know, what the co knowing what the cost of capital is, knowing how it's gonna impact your margins. And if that makes sense and your return on investment or your ROI on that is within, within parameters, then you know you can make a quick decision and say yes, because we've had tons of situations here over the past, say, 12 months where borrowers have been approved for something. They feel like, you know what, that's just too expensive because, you know, they're used to what the rates were, you know, 18 months ago. And they go out and look for another option. And then they come back, you know, 30 to 90 days later and they say, hey, you know what, I, I want that deal. And unfortunately, the deal's gone or it's more expensive now. Right. And, and it's not because I'm trying to punish anybody. It's just, that's where the, the rate environment has gone in a very short period of time. Um, so knowing, knowing your margins and knowing what that cost of capital is going to do for or to your business can make you really give you the ability to make a smart decision quickly. Yeah. And you mentioned a good point there because you and I we're in the industry, so we're constantly following what the rates are doing. And so we're never really surprised where the interest rates are. However, our clients, a lot of the time, they don't have the specific context that we do. And then what I find is when someone comes to someone like you, and like you said, they're scared off by the interest rate, they go to other locations, the opportunity cost of not acting then is going to be significant. And it's all because they have a misperception of what the interest rate should be. 
And instead of looking at the interest rate, they should look at the margin. Just like you said, they should look at the return on investment and understand that the alternative is either not doing it and making no money, basically bringing their business to a, a screeching halt or going on a wild goose chase to find something better. But they should understand that primary funding understands who they are, who the competition is and what the value of their service is. You're always priced competitively. And like you said, you provide a superior service because you are truly a service provider in the industry that focuses on the business owner and their success. And that's something that I appreciate as a individual who would refer business to someone like you and primary funding. Uh, one thing I'd like you to articulate for us is what is the typical deal size that you see? Yeah, it's it's a pretty a fairly broad range. Um, I mean, we we've we're doing deals as small as you know fifty thousand dollars on the factoring and PO side, and as large as you know three million. However, you know our our sweet spot, I think, where we're are probably at our best is anywhere is is somewhere between a hundred thousand to a million uh, facility size. I would say that's where we're going to be the most competitive and be able to move, uh, you know, the, the most quickly. Um, again, we'll help if it makes sense. We're going to help any any you know any facility size that we can we can we can work with. We're going to help them because ideally we're trying to help you grow. And you know, even if it's a smaller account, we're, our our goal is to help you grow and become a bigger account, and then eventually get to a bank. But that's really what we what we like to see is around a hundred thousand to a million in, in facility facility size. Got it. And this may be a curveball, maybe not. You're a, an expert. What if I have an SBA loan and I have a UCC filing on my business? Is that an impediment to your credit facilities? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, in, in a yes and no, right? So it just depends on the facility side, uh, on the type of facility. So, um, if we're going to be in a junior position to a, a senior lender, we're not going to be able to do most likely things like PO financing or an asset based line of credit. Um, we will in many occasions be able to provide factoring services in a second position. Um, the important thing there though, is that the accounts receivable are, you know, they're, they're, they're an, enough of good quality and significant enough for us to, to support the, the facility. And, you know, it's, it's not going to be an issue with the, the senior debt facility. Um, we always will try to get subordinations. I mean, we, you know, there's lots of SBA lenders here, like, you know, CDCs and, you know, CDFIs that will subordinate to us. Um, but if they don't, it's okay. We'll, we're willing to, to look at it and potentially can provide factoring services in a second position. Yeah, no, I appreciate you articulating that. Um, you know, that's something that business owners aren't thinking of at all. They don't understand the technicalities of what you just explained. What I'd like you to uh, discuss right now is, let's say I'm a business owner. I've gone to the bank. The bank has said, hey, we can't help you, but this is my good friend, Fernando. He's with Primary Funding. I think he can help you. Can you walk us through the process of you reviewing an opportunity? You could choose any credit facility just as an example. So reviewing the opportunity, what documents will you need um, and what does the business owner need to be prepared to provide to help you make the decision? Yeah, absolutely. So typically our process is uh, on the front end, we collect, you know, we, we have an introductory call just like, like this would be right. And just kind of try to understand the, uh, the need of the client, make sure it's a good fit. Uh, once, once we've gone through that, uh, you know, 30 minute call or so, uh, what we're going to collect is we have an application, you know, that, that we'll have filled out. We're going to need uh, accounts receivable, most current, accounts payable, most current. Uh, we'll want to see a current balance sheet and a current p and um, And then we typically also want to see a sample invoice uh, and then a corresponding PO to that invoice. And if it's available, if there's a contract or like a master service, service agreement that that is, uh, that is part of that whole package, that's what we'd want to see because that's really where, where we dig in is, is the contract you know, the payment terms and understanding if there are any, any risks there for us in getting paid once we put money out the door. Um, so those are really the items that we're going to, we're going to request and, and, and look at on average, you know, we're usually about two weeks from start to finish. And, and that's, you know, from receiving a full package to getting somebody funded, uh, and, and then, you know, moving forward with the, with the facility. Awesome. What instances would you say no? 
so if it's if it's not B2B, that's, you know, going to be like we're, we're not a good fit for like a restaurant or a retail, you know, uh, store um, on the B2B side where, you know, where we do have some real difficulties is with construction. Um, that's an industry that we, we're just not very good at, unfortunately. Uh, anything in the healthcare industry um, due to HIPAA uh, regulations is, is can be tough. Um, so I'd say those two industries uh, on, the, on the B2B side there it's going to be rare that we're able to, to say yes on those it's not a complete no but it is you know it's very specific situations that we can we can do that for um and then the on the you know stuff that that is a good fit or would seem like a good fit if your clients are you know a lot of like mom and pop type of like you know sometimes we'll get um like food distribution companies and they sell to a lot of really small restaurants right little independently owned I'm sure they're great businesses, but we, we just don't have a way to do our due diligence on, on those restaurants to see what their credit worthiness is. And, you know, our facilities are really based on the credit worthiness of your clients of who you're selling to. So if you have a lot of mom and pop businesses that you sell to independently owned businesses, those unfortunately are probably going to end up being declined just because we're unable to really figure out what the credit worthiness of your clients is. Can you expand on that? You brought up a great point, Fernando. So if I go to a bank, they're going to qualify me based on me, my business, my credit history, cash flow, debt to tangible net worth, et cetera, et cetera. But what you just said is your qualification is more based on who your uh, client is, not who you are. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's the that's the beauty of, uh, of asset-based lending, right? We are really basing our decision on the quality of the asset. So if those accounts receivables, if you're selling to companies like, you know, Amazon and uh, Home Depot and Walmart, right? And, and you know, even some of the, the, we have a lot of stuff that we do with with, ho- with some of the bigger hotels. Um, those are great because we're able to go on and we're able to do our due diligence and basically find a recommended dollar amount that in most cases is gonna suit whatever amount of business you're doing with that entity, right? Um, your credit, your cash flow, your time in history really aren't as as big factors for us. I mean, they can help. You know, obviously, if you've been in business for a long time, that's a that's a plus. You know, and or a check in the plus column. But at the end of the day, if the the quality of your accounts receivable is strong and who you're selling to, that is a huge. You know, that's just a, really so heavily weighted. That's really what we're going to make most of our decision on. Got it. Are there any large client or customers out there that if you see someone coming to you as working with, that would be a red flag? Uh, no, I mean, you know, not, not, not off the top of my head. You know, I, I think back, you know, when, when things, when, when companies were like, for example, we, we had some companies that were doing work for, for some banks. And, you know, last year there were a few banks that were, unfortunately, were having some, some real trouble and, and some hard times. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's really, it's really just based on what's kind of going on now. Cause our, our facilities are really based on where you are now, what you're doing now. I can't say that there's a business that we look at and say, Hey, that's a, a red flag. But, you know, as things progress, if there is an industry that we feel is going under more stress than another industry, then that could internally, yeah, we could definitely say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna be a little more conservative on, you know, clients that are selling to large retailers because I mean, you heard, you know, Macy's is shutting down like 150 stores, right? So maybe, you know, maybe if we look at somebody selling to Macy's, we're gonna just double, you know, just think twice and say, hey, okay, let's just understand exactly, you know, where we are with this and how much exposure we have and really understand that. But I mean, it's really gonna be a case by case. Got it. No, I appreciate you sharing that as well. So. Um... As we jumped on this call, one of the things that you had mentioned is that number one, you're very busy. That's fantastic. You're closing these credit facilities and there are challenges and difficulties to closing. Uh, I never get too excited uh, when I get a letter of interest. I never get too excited when I get an approval um, because I know that getting across the finish line has its own difficulties and challenges. Can you share what those difficulties and challenges getting across the finish line are and how business owners can help smooth that out when you get closer to the close of the credit facility? Yeah, a hundred percent. So, you know, I I think in our industry, it's, it's 
pretty specific. I mean, typically what happens is, you know, with, with any factory or purchase order financing facility, we, we have what's called cash dominion, right? So what that means is we're basically sending out a, a notice of assignment to the AP department of whatever customer you're working with and saying, Hey, we're providing financing. Please send all future payments to our lockbox or to our account if it's ACH. Um, so that's where in our industry, that's where we run into most of our hangups, right? I mean, some, sometimes that more and more now that can be a process where you have to go through a number of steps in order to do that and get that information updated. So that can sometimes add, you know, either a few days or I've even seen it add as much as a month, you know, to, to getting that, that set up. Um, that's really the, the biggest one for us, but where we do run into, you know, I would say, you know, if I could give a, a, l- a little bit of advice, right. To, it's just, just be upfront about, you know, all, like all the warts and stuff. Like we, we, we've seen a lot of rough deals. We've been able to get a lot of rough deals done. The, the ones that we have the most trouble with are the ones that hide things that don't, you know, don't want to disclose everything. It's like, just disclose it all. And then it's our job to figure out, okay, how do we structure a way to mitigate all of these issues here and just move forward with the deal? Cause believe me, we want to, we want to fund it. And I don't, you know, I don't want to sit here and, and, and hear you tell me, Oh, well, there's, you know, there's this and that, and you're not going to like this or that. Well, that's fine. That's, that's my job is to figure out how to, how to get around those things. Right. So, um, the, and the clients that have been open books and that just come to you and they're like, this is, this is all the ugly. Here's everything. You know, what, what can you, how can you help me? And then it's, you know, and even if it's, if it's like, Hey, we can't, well, at least we've all saved a ton of time. Right. And I, and I can just tell you, Hey, this is not the right fit right now. And maybe I can recommend somebody else that would be a, a good fit for you. I mean, we're really, you know, San Diego's such a small town, you know, very well connected with tons of other lenders. And I'm, I'm happy to make a recommendation to somebody that I think would be a better fit. Um, and so those are the clients that are upfront about everything that, that we just, we don't waste time, things popping up because everything comes out in the end. Right. Everything comes down in the end and I'll have people share something with me and say, we probably shouldn't share it with the bank yet. And I said, no, like you really need to understand the sooner we get ahead of these issues, the better, because either you want to know whether this kills the deal and then that way everyone can stop working on it or, and I'll tell you 99% of the time, like you said, you can mitigate the issue by fleshing it out early on in the process, structuring around it. And then that way there are no surprises at the end. So I really appreciate you saying that if you're watching this, you're a business owner and you have some history, uh, you're going to be applying for a loan of any sort. Just know that sharing everything, divulging everything up front about your past or history is going to benefit you toward qualifying for that credit facility. Now what I'd like to do, Fernando, is pivot. If you could connect the dots with a case study of somebody who came to you had a problem, was turned down by the bank, and then you guys just hit it out of the park for them. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, so yeah, we, we had a recent this uh, client that came to us, and he's he, he's a, uh, a security contractor, right? And actually provides guards uh, on location. Uh, been in business for years, um, really good track record and everything. But landed again a, a huge contract, right? With uh, with uh, one of the one of these municipalities. Uh, here in Southern California, and um, just had to hire a bunch of uh, new armed guards, was going to get paid, you know, because the contract had increased so much. And this is a client he had already had for years, but because the the contract was increasing so much, they were actually going to start stretching his payment terms, you know, from 30 to 60 days. And so for him, great opportunity, but he just knew that the the payroll on this was going to, was really going to kill him if he didn't have financing, right? So, um, so, we, you know, great. this was a great example, too, because we were able to help him out. We got him set up. We actually did an, an asset-based line of credit at first for about $350,000, and it worked great for him. But then suddenly, he, you know, his capital needs increased even more, right? So we, we bumped up the facility again and uh, were able to help him continue to, to hire ahead and, and do what he had to do. Then it, it just, I mean, it, we're up to close to a million now. And so at that point, you know, we, we actually had to transition and pivot. We said, hey, we... We really can't do, you know, large ABL facilities like this, you know, but if we, if we transition you to factoring, then we have a lot more runway and we can really, you know, provide scale more quickly than, than what, you know, than what you, what you currently have. Um, and so, you know, we talked through it, you know, we even talked to a CPA and kind of, you know, went over everything with her and, 
And at the end of the day, we, we came to the conclusion, Hey, yeah, this is the right, this is the right fit. And, you know, and, and we appreciated that, you know, he allowed us to really, you know, go to what essentially is a little bit more restrictive facility, but it gave us the ability to fund so much more uh, and, and keep the money out longer. Um, and so that was a great success story for us. Cause one, we, we helped the client initially, we got the deal done and we were really happy about that. But then as we ran into more issues with, with what was going on and his, his funding needs, how they kept growing, we were able to pivot and, and really help him understand as a team, you know, us, the business owner, their CPA and all work together and, and really understood that, Hey, this is going to be the best way to go for now. And, you know, he might be with us for another year and then hopefully we'll be able to transition him out to a bank. Got it. And how long does it take from beginning to end before someone actually is approved and those funds are available? So on average, we're at about two weeks. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah, funds out the door, right? So um, where, you know, if a client has a very diversified pool of, of, or the borrower has a very diversified pool of customers, that can take a little bit longer, not to start funding, but to fulfill the full facility size, right? Because if you've got, you know, 20 different customers that you're selling to, and we start getting those redirects in place, right? Maybe we get 10 of them to start and we can only fund based on those 10. And it might take us another two or three weeks to get the other, the other ones uh, in place before we can fund fully on everything. Um, but really about two weeks is, is what we like to target. We have done some rush jobs where, you know, if client is really coming to us uh, with their hair on fire, which, which does happen from time to time, um, and we'll, we'll get it done a little bit quicker in a week sometimes, but that is not easy to do. Got it. No, absolutely. Uh, Fernando, this has been fantastic. You have provided such great information. Uh, this is the time in the episode when you now have the opportunity to tell people who you are, how they can find you, and which service area you can service. Yeah, thank you. Well, again, thank you, Ryan. This is a uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, I'm very grateful and, and we'll definitely do our part in promoting your, uh, your podcast as well. Um, so really the best place to find me is our, our website, you know, primaryfunding.com. You can get all the information there. Um, my email is uh, fponce, F-P-O-N-C-E at primaryfunding.com. Uh, we are, you know, we're in Southern California and the bulk of our customers are, are in California, um, but we can go pretty much anywhere in the country. Um, so if, if you have financing needs and you're not in, in California, that's okay. Reach out to us. We're happy to see if we'd be a fit. You know, for us, it's all about the right fit. And if, if we work well with a, with a client and based on where they are and what their needs are, and if it's not, we just, we just say, hey, let's find you a better fit, right? Because we want you know, uh, a, a, it's a partnership and that that partnership should work really well. And you should like the people that you're working with, that you're borrowing money from, that we're lending money to. We want to have a good relationship with everybody. So we just love to, you know, really learn the business, understand what your needs are and then go from there. Yeah. Well, you are a great shop. Um, you really do a, a great service for small business owners. And Fernando, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and you have a great rest of the day. You too. Thank you.